What I've tried to do in these first things is give you a real grounding so that you know, as a director, this is what I'm taking on. I'm not taking on an activity that people like to do and we'll all go and listen. I'm taking on the creation of an artwork so that it lives in front of people in a way that they are experience what the author was about, not just understand it intellectually or kind of get it or... I'm not doing anything tonight, so I'm going to go see a play like when people turn on the television. It's not that, but that it's a, it's a significant thing. For human endeavor, mm. it's a significant thing. Right. When you were talking about the director has to be the authority on the piece, the expert on the piece, when you would direct, how would you prepare yourself prior to uh, your first rehearsal in terms of becoming that authority, assuming that you start out not being an authority on the piece, because it may be a play that you haven't read yet, that you're reading for the first time. Maybe it's a new play. Do you, is it, is say it how it's many your favorite play to go see, mm -hmm. even. Yeah. Say you've read it ten times, but not just because you like it, not as a director. Right. You, you have no business touching it. You're not ready. You haven't gone back and looked at it the way a director looks at it. Why is this Grover's Corners? Why is this New Hampshire? Why is he the stage manager rather than coming out and just starting to be the play? Why is it presentational rather than representational? Why is this person named what they're named? Why is this two mother and father family shown instead of only one or three? Why is somebody in here in this relationship who everything the play suggests the uh, author meant to be construed as homosexual. Why, 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 why? Right. So you won't have done that by enjoying the no. play. No. You don't know any of that. You just enjoy it. Right. And subconsciously you get its message. And subconsciously you know who Simon Stimson is when you read it. Yeah. But you don't consciously say who he is. Right. And therefore when you're about to direct somebody else, what people do in general is that they come to that time and try to get them to say the lines right and move where they tell them to to give some impression of what we call illustrating the lines. I'm so tired of doing this all the time, boy. Mm -hmm. Illustrating the lines. Yeah. And that's it's what people think a play is. Taking the text at text value instead exactly. of... Yeah, yeah. Exactly. One of the first things that I teach in script interpretation and that I talked about in the acting class, is that every line does not mean what it says on face value. There may be a few. Sometimes when you ask for it, the salt, it, you just want the effing salt, right? No, 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 no. No, not in a play. Not really. No, it's always in relation to what's going on there. For instance, the two people out on their first date, they're both a little nervous, uh, doesn't know what to say, then he'll ask for the salt. And so he's not asking for the salt, although he wants the salt. But he doesn't want the salt now at this moment and saying it because he wants the salt. That's just a linguistic reason, if you will. That's just an everyday ordinary reason. Somebody wants the salt, they ask for the salt. Mm -hmm. In a play, he doesn't want that. He can use the salt. He would like the salt. But the reason he asks now is that it's been silent and I don't know what to say to this girl and I don't want to give her the sense that I'm too stupid to talk. So now I'll say, um, you mind passing the salt? I probably eat too much salt. There's not a guy concerned about how much salt he eats. That's filling the time with the girl. It's always that, even if it's just passing the mm -hmm. salt. And that comes down to knowing human behavior. Right. How do people behave? And I think it's in my life and art, but I'm not sure. But in one of the Stanislavski things, 
he's teaching this guy who wants to be a director how to look at life. He says, he picks out a couple and says, what, tell me what's happening over there. And the guy goes, well, there's two people and they're talking. What do you want me to know? And he tells him, no, when, there's a whole scene, there's a whole drama being played out right in front of your eyes. When she stands that way, and when he does that way, and when he turns his head at that moment, all of those are meaningful to their psychological relationship to each other. And then he has him pick somebody else who's walking toward him, and the guy he says, well, I think I know who this guy is. He's either an accountant, or he's uh, a journalist, maybe. Stanislavski says, how do you know that that's the case? He says, well, you see, when he walks, he has uh, one of those little pen protectors in his pocket. And so maybe he's a, maybe he's a draftsman. But in other words, now what he's doing is looking at somebody and making a hypothesis based on what he sees, not just looking at some two people who are arguing and say, I don't know, they seem to be arguing. And then he takes him further on. So he takes him through this process of being able to look at people and see what's going it's on. very there. Sherlock holmes In a sense to... it is, yes. In a sense it is. A director has to be able to look at life and know how people behave and then recognize that behavior, which has been encrypted into a play, and decrypt that. So that's what script analysis really is. It's going in and saying, I know how people behave. When she says that, now why? So, so when you read this a play is the to prepare, you, you, yes, you, start, whole different you start reading it. If I had never read it, it before, I'd just read it as an audience. Just for the first it. time. Yeah. Let me see what it says. But then each time you go back Next and read time it. through, I'd say, already. And, and in script interpretation, I teach the process. First of all, why is it titled The Country Girl? There doesn't seem to be anybody there from the country. You know the play The Country Girl? I think I've seen so it. Yeah, yeah. But I can't remember exactly the plot, yeah. You have to know why it's called The Country Girl. She's not a country girl. Who's the play about? You gotta know that. You have to know this principle of theater and movie writing. An actual, well-done script. It's about one person. That's what it's about. Everybody else is there, not for their thing. They're in there in relation to that one person. So if one person is a man whose wife is dying, and how am I going to deal with her dying? And then I find out from my daughter that she was having an affair. Everybody in that place in relation to that guy. Sounds like a George Clooney movie. Yes. Not a very good one, by the way. <laughs> because they didn't do... Part of the problem was they didn't do what I'm just talking about now. Everybody in that play has to function in relation to him. And he's got to function with, how do I go on in life knowing this? So, you say, what's the title? What does that mean? Why is it named this? The title usually refers to the life of the main character. Is the key figure in Long Day's Journey Edmund? The key figure is the mother. Did you say that good plays, it's about one person. So there, it's the mother. Now, there are always people involved with the main character who have significant connections. But the main character is not there in relation to the other people. The other people are there in relation to the main character. And everybody in Long Day's Journey is in relation to the mother and her problem, because the title, Long Day's Journey Into Night, is the reference to her drug, addiction. her drug addiction having been restarted in a way that now everybody realizes it's not going to be defeated. It will have her from now on. Because she had it before, supposedly was cured, and now they see they thought she was cured and wasn't. So the whole play is in, in relation to her. So the son is in relation to her and what he wants and so forth. What he, what he wants his mother to be and who he would be if his mother were different. And if his mother were different and his father were different. How these things affect him. That's, it, it's a significant connection in the play. But he's not the lead. He's there in relation to what the mother is going through. If the mother wasn't going through that, he wouldn't be who he is. Does that mean, is it possible that we see it through his eyes, or do we see it through her eyes? It's not from their point of view. It's from the point of view of recognizing that this person is what this is about, and also recognizing that everybody else is there to feed the long day's journey in tonight, which is talking about her journey. Now, rich plays have a value, as that play does, 
it's also everybody else's long day's journey into night. They do it together. Because nobody is better off because of what happens to her. So they're going into their own separate nights. Right. But it's caused by her doing that. So you can't say it's from one's perspective more than the other in that particular It's not play. point of view. Yeah. Point of view would be that everything in the play we see from her attitudes. Right. And see from, but the play, the, isn't play written. Written. the play isn't written like that. No. And you mentioned that in Three Sisters. Richard III is written from his point of view. Right. He comes up at the beginning, tells you what the story is. Right. You watch now as he does that and goes through the things. Right. And tries to make himself come out the way he thinks he deserves to come out. So that's yeah. totally from his point of view. In Hamlet? It's from his point of view. You had mentioned also in Three Sisters, it really is, they function as one yes. character. So they are the main character, yes. the three of them together. Right. Yeah. And how they are the main character is you have one person too young to be going through the problems that the play suggests, one person who's going through them, and one person who went through them and didn't succeed positively for herself. And those are the three sisters. So you get three, and how they're in relation to the... But if you're going to say who's the main character, it's the middle sister who's going through it. Yeah, I would think so. And the other two are in relation to that thing. Now, Olga, uh, 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 did she actually go through it uh, unsuccessfully, right? She never really had a love. Uh, well, I no, it's not, it's not by that. I mean, she has navigated the difficulties of a woman trying to find out where she belongs in life badly. And she's left alone. And she's left alone being the mother to two people who she's not the mother of. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, she doesn't become, she becomes a school teacher and a mother Figure. by proxy. Yeah. But that's not the fulfilling life of a woman. And so, to, to love and to be with one who is one's soulmate, we would say now, is the fulfilling thing with the woman. And is this woman going to do it? Or is she going to stay married to somebody she doesn't love? And while the man she... Versheen and who she loves... Or thinks she does. Disappears into the ether. He's got sleeves. Stri strings attached. He's yeah. got a crazy wife, and he's in the military, which right. is... <laughs> so, so that, in that play, they really function as one character. It's just three views in time of that character's life. And so it, it, it's enriched. In a sense, Irina hasn't gone through any of it. She's but, still young. But she sees it in front of her. Masha's going through it now. Right. Olga, Olga is past it. Past it. Never yeah. really found it. Right. She. That's why I said before, she went through this and, from a woman's point of view, wasn't able to fulfill it successfully. So, what it's essentially asking is, Masha, you know you're not Irina. She's young and bright-eyed and all of this excited that there's going to be a parade. You know that she may, by the way, have been that when she was younger. She may have been much more like Irina when she was younger. But now... She knows, I'm not a girl anymore, I'm a woman. So what does that mean for my future? What does that mean for my life? And then you see Olga, who is past it. Olga never married. Masha marries someone who she has no business marrying. She's not in love with at all. But the whole thing is that she doesn't have the man she could have. It's, and it's a particular time, same, same general time frame as Hedda Gabler. Exactly the same question. Both of those are dealing with, you know, really from a sociological point of view, both of those plays are dealing with what is a woman's position in life. And how society really doesn't give them, I mean, society boxes them in. Basically. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the natural human, regardless of society, how should a, how should a woman live, is what the three sisters is to show you. To show you it's not, you're not supposed to live as a child, like Arena, and you're not supposed to live like Olga, who didn't have anything that a woman was supposed to really have. And so she's at the point of saying, now I have what a woman is supposed to really have, the love of my life, who the other social circumstances, fuck it, I'm going to go for. Hershini. Yeah. yeah. So, But then, of course, life has a funny way. Because well, he's, no, a, he, well, he's a military man. He's no, 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 I know those way. things. Yeah, yeah. Those are complicating factors. Yeah. But good plays always have complicating factors. But those complicating factors are complicating for the central character's reality. It's a complication. 
that she has to bust up two marriages if she wants to be with him. Especially since Rashina's wife can't make it on her own. Mm -hmm. She can't just go out and be like Olga. She has mental problems, mm -hmm. is what it suggests. So she'll have to be cared for. So I'm going to ruin this woman's life, which is already bad enough, mm -hmm. by taking her husband. Well, I'd say that the author is saying that there are a number of truths in reality in life, but there's usually something which is more true for her. And for her, she has to take it. She found a soulmate. Yes, but she has to take it. In a sense, people quite often now in the society we live in partner up with all kinds of people on what in the old days would have been considered very unsubstantial reasons. We like them, we enjoy going places together, whatever else. But that's not the person for that. Now, sometimes it grows into the person. And in good marriages, for instance, that's what will happen. The people will grow together over time. And that person who wasn't your soulmate, you find out one day he is. Because the life that you've spent together, the way you've dealt with each other, enriches your experience of each other. You're saying years ago they, they would find a reason to get together with people because you enjoy each other's company? No, years ago there were two choices. You marry for social reasons, right? or you go after your love. Did they even do that? <laughs> go after their love sure. years ago? Sure. That's what Hedda Gabler is about. She has the chance to go with love board. Not to be married in the normal social conventions and all of that. Maybe they would get married. Who knows? But she wouldn't have a church wedding. They would fly away together in passion and share their passions for each other and for life. Because they have the same passions for each other and they have the exact same passions for life. But she is too much constrained by her father's social status and everything that when they're young and the opportunity is there, for them to run away together and just be each other's other. She can't do it. Now, that's a perfect example of a play where you start out and say, what's the name of that play? Hedda Gabler. Why? Now, do you see anything about that that's more than just it, the name of the play? Is, is there some reference to what she calls herself? In other words, the name she goes by in that play? First of all, it says... She goes by Hedda. Oh, well, first of all, it says she's... It tells you she's the central character, right? That's, yeah. that's the obvious thing, right? Right, right. right. Um, but and what else? Uh, in that play, does she have more than one? Does she go by more than one name? In other words, is that the name that she should call herself? Or I'm asking you. I'm trying to recall. I can't. I can't. I can't. Is recall. she married or single? Uh, I can't remember. And I saw it two years ago on on, on Broadway. I can't she's remember. married to an ineffectual uh, man whose name is Tesman. Oh, okay. So her yeah. real name is Hedda Tesman. Now, if you name the play about a woman whose name is Hedda Tesman, Hedda Gabler, because that was her... Her maiden name. Right. So in other words, he's naming it Hedda Gabler, even though in the play she's now Hedda Tesman, to say that that's her, that's her who she is. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's not Hedda Tesman. Right. She will never be Hedda Tesman. She will always be Hedda Gabler. If you start out with that title and you talk about it in terms of this, you already know most of what to do in the play. If you take the principle I mentioned before, that everybody in the play is in relation to the story of the main character, and so their behavior is not their behavior, their behavior in relation to the main character. Then you know how everybody else is supposed to deal with them. So that if you have Judge Brock dealing with her at various times, when, when Tessman, her husband, deals with her at various times, you know what the truth for him is. The truth for him is he married somebody of a high social level, her father was General Gabler. This was the town where they had 500 generals. The, the, the general of the town would have been the big cat in the whole town, and he is. And so there's a social status in that. Military officers at that time were not people who went out and fought. They might go to the battleground five miles away on top of the hill while their troops fight for them. But they weren't, you know, one wasn't like Spartacus, I'm Spartacus. That's a perfect example. You see Spartacus, he's I'm Spartacus, everybody's fighting. But where is Crassus? Olivier. He's up on the hill sitting on his horse with a couple of other... Watching the battle. Watching the battle. Yeah. And that's what 
the military is the aristocracy. But the point I'm trying to make about the military reality at that time is the military officers were not military. They were military by title. They were the aristocracy. So she is the highest aristocracy in the town. Tessman is a school teacher. That's middle class. So he married up. Married up. Now, if you realize the name is Hedda Gabler and these things that we're talking about, who she is, no matter what happens, she cannot change. She cannot sink from her social class. Her whole life and expectations deal with that. That's her personality. I'm Hedda Gabler. Even though she wouldn't say that. Someone calls her Mrs. Tessman. She wouldn't say, no, I'm still Hedda Gabler. But the author says that. So you know that she's still in the other role, even though now she's married this man, Tessman, because there's nothing else to do. She married down. Yes. So her father was more than likely disappointed by that. No, her father was dead. So she doesn't have a father to take care of her. There is a sense, I don't know if it's just romanticized, but that if you have the love of your life at some point, then the other loves you have aren't really the love of your life. I mean, they could be good, they could be wonderful, but they're not another love of your life. It's not going to be the love of your life. So, love for is the love of her life. She can't have him. She definitely can't have him now because she's not knowing what else to do. And love for had disappeared into the hinterlands. Mary Tesla. Another principle of script analysis, which that thing over there that says Samsung, what is that? It's a uh, TV. Yeah, you don't see a sign on it saying television, right? No. You don't see a sign on it saying lamp. Right. We don't put titles to things. You don't drive in the street uh, in the country, I mean, on a country road, see a farm, you see a cow standing over there with a sign hanging off of it that says cow. No. A title is not an identifying thing. We already know what the thing is. And even if you don't know what it is, it's not going to have a title. If you're walking on the way home in the street, there's a piece of machinery that looks like it came out of the bottom of a car or a truck. Whatever it is, you don't know, still doesn't have a title on it. Play has a title. Why? It's a play. Why does it have to have a title? Because the title is a metaphor for what this is about. So every play's title is a metaphor. Therefore, even things that sound straightforward, the tragedy of Richard III, that title is a metaphor for something. It means the Richard III he thinks he could have been. The real title of Hamlet is the tragedy of Hamlet, comma, Prince of Denmark. Not King of Denmark, Prince of Denmark. So what is that play about? Is how am I ever going to be king of Denmark when these things have happened? And including the death of my father and the marriage of my mother to my uncle, who now is the king. What was I studying? To become a doctor? No, he was studying to become a king. And that was taken out of him. When you deal with the full title of Tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, Prince of Denmark now is metaphorical of who he is, and who he should be. So that you know the action of that play deals with how is it that I'm going to get to who I should be, which is King of Denmark. How will I get there? Now, given this circumstance. Therefore, the uncle is there only because he kills his father. The mother is there only because she seems to have betrayed his father. Now, what do you get from the mother and the stepfather? What you should get in that play is how sexually alive they are to each other. And probably that in Hamlet's experience, that sexual liveness didn't exist between his father and his mother. His father and his mother were probably married, as most people of high stature were at that time, for political reasons. Henry VIII's first wife, who he's trying to get rid of, he married for political reasons because he wanted to cement a close relationship with Spain so that England and Spain would have France on two sides. You invade us, the Spanish will come after you. You invade the Spanish, we'll come after you. So sit tight to us. That's why I married Catherine of Aragon in the first place. So, Hamlet, mother and father, may very well not have been sexual, passionate sexual lovers. No, I don't mean to suggest they would have never had sex. They had Hamlet, so they've had it at least once, you know. But that doesn't mean they're passionate. You, you can see people who are coupled and see who are passionate with each other who aren't. Based on their behavior with each other? Yeah. In public? 
Yeah. Somebody who stops and kisses fully standing on the street corner because both of them have the passion and they could not do it. Those are passionate people with each other. They're sexually, sensually passionate people with each other. Other people who don't touch, who sit across from each other, who don't really look at each other, who don't see them looking deep into each other's eyes ever. You know, there may be a couple. Now, most couples aren't that. Are not passionate. Right. But Gertrude and Claudius are. So now not only... Which only boils Hamlet all the more, isn't it? And the fact that they're like that makes him say, uh, honeying in the sty about her, you know, uh, I can't wait to something in honeying in the sty in the closet scene with his mother. He rakes her over the coals for, the, for her sexuality. Now, those are things in the play because it makes his life how am I going to be who I'm supposed to be? That play is about a, a young man's attempt at self-actualization. That's what it's about. Self-actualization. And how in the hell am I going to reach it with these obstacles that have been thrown in my way? That's what it's about. Who am I going to be when I grow up? And, and particularly so, because everything he was taught that he was going to be, which is, and as you said, trained to be king right. of Denmark, has suddenly been exactly. usurped. Right. And so, well, am I going to take it, or am I going to stand up to it? Right. And further complication, avenging my father's right. death, which is my obligation as a son. Right. If indeed what I think happened actually happened. Right. But a further complication is I have to go against my mother in order to do all that. Yeah. It means I have to see her as who she is. If she wasn't sexual with the uncle, who would be so furious with her? Like most young men, there are Oedipal realities with a mother who's sexual. It's not that they literally want to kill mother. I'm, I'm planning to find my mother. Who would it be great if I could kill <laughs> my mother? It's not that. It's not. But it's that they are affected by her sexuality. They are aroused to her sexuality. So if they see that with the father, they're aroused to it in a positive way because she's with my father. That's what it's supposed to be. And in other words, it's sublimated in the son when he sees the sexuality with her, with the father, as long as the father is not castrated. Right, because wouldn't Freud say actually it isn't all that positive? <laughs> no, it would be if if he's if the father hasn't behaved in him in ways that make him feel that. And Hamlet's father did not behave in ways that make him feel that. So if the mother were more sexual with the father, it would his own sexual feelings towards his mother would be sublimated into the adoration of the parental units. Yes, exactly. Now, his Oedipal realities go wild when she wasn't that sexy with her father, but she's crazy about the, the uncle, uncle yeah. who I think killed him. So now, so now he's going to be curious with her. Because she's not only doing it to him, she's going to, doing it to me when she does it. And again, the name of the play should be probably Hamlet Jr., Prince of Denmark. The fact that the father's name is exactly the same as the son's means that his identification is even stronger. I am of that man. That man is me. So that's why Shakespeare gives the father the same name as the son. Reasons, reasons, reasons. So all of the things, when you have read a play over, you know it very well, both, but now I'm going to direct it. How you become that authority is that you have to take apart everything in that play and recognize that this is a piece of a jigsaw puzzle that tells a story, that the title is a metaphor for. So it's a series of asking questions. Yeah. You have to know which questions to ask as well. No, you just have to say, why is this this? And what happens is, as you go through it, you start to find out why it is. And sometimes you're not even thinking of anything. And you think, you know, you're walking down the street. As you go through the play, what happens is you start to see what the pieces are pieces to. But if you do not do this, it's very easy to assume things. And if you think you already know, well, you know, intuitively I got a sense of that, so already I know. And now as I think of it, I say, well, it's done for this reason. Not enough. You have to say, wait a minute, I am sure that it is done for this reason, not it might be done for this reason. Right. Did you ever come across a play where you, you asked yourself, okay, why is it titled this? And it, and, it, and it took you a while. 
in other words, it didn't make sense at first. And you just had to investigate and investigate until you, of course, until you had, until you got it. Yeah, yeah. It's only after I knew what no man's land was about that I realized what no man's land is about. Aha. Uh-huh. So that would be an example of one where you said, "Why is the title this?" Right. And it, well, no, I just said, "What's well, that's the title, No Man's Land." But what's going into it? And then I started dealing with it, dealing with it, dealing with it. I wasn't even going to direct it. I just did it because I wanted to know what the play was. You did direct it? No, I wasn't. Oh, oh yeah, it. I thought. Yeah. But by the way, when I when I read that, I had already directed all times, ah. and so I knew what I was dealing with. And by that, I mean I knew the kind of author I was dealing with. It's not how to be a director. What realm are you walking into of human endeavor? What realm is that if you say, I want to direct a play or direct a movie? What realm is that? Well, it's this realm that we've been talking about so that when an audience sees it, they get it. They have the experience. They have the experience, which reminds them what it's like to be a human being. Yeah. That's what it's about. They should have sort of an aha moment, shouldn't they? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, anything that's done well, you'll have that. And like you, you said, sit they'll sit there and they'll go, yup, that's what that is. Yeah, exactly. And I've experienced it, and I'm now experiencing it again through this piece of art. Right. Yeah. And again, I, I love, I can't remember whose description it is, but it's never an art object says, oh, I didn't know what that was. Gee, now I know. No, it's always, oh, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Right, I get it. I remember now. You know, in life, you don't pay enough attention. You're always doing with, you know, am I going to the dentist or not tomorrow? The car has a flat. In it. And besides, my wife tells me I don't spend enough time with her. So you don't just live. There's back to about now. Mm-hmm. So as you go through these things, what is the title? The title of the play is The Country Girl. What country? What does country mean? Well, this girl, she's not a young girl. It's not about a young girl. It's some, about somebody's wife. She's married to an older man who's an actor, who's a drunk, and who, who's ruined his career because of his alcoholism. But now he has a chance to have a comeback. What does that have to do with being in the country? I'm not sure I know. What's her name? What does her name mean? If somebody's named that, what's the difference if it was Betty or Josephine or Evangeline? So you have to keep asking yourself a question. You go back and say, I'm not sure yet I know what the country girl part is. What's country about it? What is a country girl? You don't stop wrestling with it just because you don't know it. But also it's not something where you say, I'm not going to explore anything. I'm going to beat myself in the head all day long until I figure out without other information from the play, I just by staring at the title all day long. That's not the process. Now, if you don't know what drama is, if you don't know what art is, nobody's going to ask that question. Because they're not trying to create a metaphorical experience. They're trying to just have an experience. Let's put on the jugglers. No, we're tired of seeing jugglers. This time we'll put on a skit. (laughs) They treat plays, the presentation of plays, or even movies, as if they're skits. And by the way, that's why they cast in Hollywood. They cast stand-up comics and the things and so forth like that. It's a skit. He can play a skit. So in a sense, they see it as pure entertainment only, yeah. right? Uh, a time an, killer. As an activity. Activity which... Rather than the imitation of an action. The imitation of an action. Action meaning experience of life. A metaphorical representation of humanity. 